I was having breakfast this morning out. One of my favorite places, and the waitress knows I'm in the ministry, and she said, well, what are you going to preach on today? I said, mad at God. And um, I was just horsing around playing with her and uh, didn't, didn't realize that the people sitting at the <laughs> other table. And uh, she came back later and said, they, they're kind of upset with you. <laughs> and you're so mad at God. And, uh, you know, you, you, ministries come in strange ways, don't they? So I went over and told him that was a sermon I was going to preach today that I wasn't really mad at God. Uh, you have your Bibles. I'll open them to this Genesis 4 passage where we've been for I don't know how many weeks. We've been in Genesis and finally got to 4. But I'm in 4 and 5, and we read about this earlier today. The, the two sons of Adam were told to bring an offering for sin. It was at that, you remember we, we, we paid attention to this in verse 3, so it came about in the course of time. That's a very specific Hebrew idiom uh, for um, a scheduled event that's very important. And it was a rite of passage. The Hebrews um, Old Testament looked at two rites of passages. The first one was a rite of passage from childhood into adulthood by identifying some kind of, uh, of career orientation. And the other was for salvation. And this one in Genesis 4 is dealing with salvation. They were both told to bring an offering for sin. And so Abel brought, uh, in verse 4, he brought the firstlings of the flock and the fat portions. That's a specific offering for sin under the old covenant of shadow Christology. Uh, a lamb without blemish or spot, First, First Peter 1, 19. A lamb without blemish, no birth defects, no growth defects. That would be a perfect offering of blood for sin. And Cain uh, didn't want to bring it. He decided to bring his own offering uh, from the ground. And uh, I said in the first hour, so he came up with a fruit salad. Uh, and he brought the fruit salad, the best fruit salad probably that ever been. And God rejected it because it has to be a blood offering for sin of Christ. Well, here's what happened to this, and this is where we are today. Cain, but for Cain and his offering, I'm in verse 5, he had no regard, so Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to him, now remember, his, the Lord has rejected his offering because it wasn't for sin. It was for self. And so he rejected it. So Cain's offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, and here's my point. The Lord, even though he brought the wrong offering, the Lord gave him another chance. You know, the Lord is full of chances for you. You know what I mean? Think how many times the offer was on the table and you walked away from it and then later thought, well, I might be interested. And he came back and the offer was still there. <laughs> Thank God. And so he offers him, watch what he does. He asks him two questions. The Lord asked him two questions. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? In other words, he's offered him a, a way back in. What are you mad about? 
you know this is an offering for sin. And what would cause you to become so angry that you're out of control? Your countenance falling is an idea where your body, soul, and spirit, when they, when they work together, you're called well or healthy. And when they get out of whack, you're unhealthy and sick. And his body, soul, and spirit are out of whack to such a degree you might... We would call the, your countenance falling, we would call it body language. We would most often see it in body language in people. And, it, and he was just, he had just gone, he was out of control. And then he tells him what he can do about it. Look at verse 7. If you will do well, that is, do the right thing that God asks you to do. If you will do what God asks you to do, the right thing, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you do not do well, sin crouches at the door and is desirous for you, but you must master it. We're going to talk about that next time. We're going to talk about what does this mean? Sin crouching at a door and you can master it. We'll talk about that next time. But this time, I want you to see 2 Peter 3.9. I want you to see this when he says, God is, God is patient and long-suffering, not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. All he's asking from Cain, look, you brought the wrong offering. That'll, that's never acceptable. A fruit, a, as good as a fruit salad is and as healthy it could be, it is not for a sin offering. Just bring me the correct sin offering and your whole life will be changed. Your, your, your countenance will be lifted up rather than dropping to the nth degree. So we're going to talk about this today. I, I, found, I found this a very interesting idea for me. I found this interesting that when he got, he got so mad of God that he got out of control. You've seen people like that, have you not? Well, probably, if, you know, if you're aware of other people. This was an interesting comment to me because it revealed a history of suppression of some personal issue. When you can become so mad at something, you can lose control. This was a type of reason that Paul encourages us, in my opinion, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Paul writes this in Ephesians 2, 26 and 27. There's a good reason for that. It's, it's where anger takes you. It takes you places you shouldn't go. And it, it, it hurts people that shouldn't be hurt. Paul is encouraging us in that Ephesians 4.26, Paul is encouraging us to address such anger issues whenever it becomes the subject, watch this, of either suppression or avoidance or putting off dealing with the former manner of life. That, for example, that's discussed in Ephesians 4.22 of my passage, Ephesians 4.26.27. You see, what is happening is the cycling, watch this now, a cycling of a sin pattern. This, listen to me now, and how do you know that, Ron? Listen to what Jesus said now. Listen, li listen to... Let me go back to my passage in Ephesians, uh, at uh, um, Genesis 4, when he says this. Watch, he says, let me tell you what the root cause is. And what the root source is, sin, watch this now, sin is crouching at the door and is desirous for you, but you must learn to master it. You understand that? Now we'll go back into that next subject. I'm going to enter that subject in a pretty good degree the next time we meet. But what he's talking about here is you can't allow, you've got to disrupt this pattern 
of, of, of sin that leads you into places like this. You got to, only person that can control, listen, whose sin is it that's crouching at the door? It's yours. And what are you told to do? Learn how to master it. And when that word crouching you're going to see is a, a wild animal on the prowl for food. And, and listen, if he's hungry enough, he'll leap at the most anything that comes next. I mean, he might even consider an elephant one time. That, that's the point. Now, let me talk about a few things and then we'll go home. I want to talk about addressing and resolving anger issues in your life where they never get out of control. The, you're responsible for the sin crouching at the door. You've got to learn to master it. Agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. One reason a person may feel this way is because in the beginning, in other words, I'm trying to figure out why, why did Cain, why are you getting so mad that you're out of, it's out of control and your body's shaking and everything? One reason a person may feel this way is because in the beginning he felt justified being in the right regarding the cause of anger. This was certainly true with Cain. Maybe like Cain, you felt justified in what you believed, whether it was true or false. But it was unjustified because it was it, it unjustified based on an absolute standard of the word of God. Cain, why are, why are you so upset? I mean, God told you what you were supposed to bring. Why didn't you bring it? Why aren't we addressing that? You see, that's that point. If you do well, you know what's interesting? Now, look, I wrote on your paper, yatab. That's the Hebrew word for do well. And notice a hip field. Now, I know you think, well, I, in the Hebrew, hip field is very important because it's causative. Causative. In other words, in this case, where we're talking about an issue of, of judgment, it's a it's a, a motivation factor, a motivation factor causative or showing what is behind what is causing you to do this. If you do well, why haven't you? In other words, if you do well is positive listen to the truth of the directive will of God. What was the directive will of God? Bring a sin offering, a blood sacrifice, or to wash away my sin. Not about the blood of Jesus. You, you, that's what I ask you to bring. You didn't bring that. So let's talk about motive and cause. Why would you do that? See, if you do well, that's a half field that's causative or motivation. What is your motive? What is the motive behind this? It should be positive listen to the truth. Just bring what God said and everything will go well. If you do not, see, if you do not well, See, that word low on it is a negative not. If you do not well, notice that's a hip field, imperfect, negative volition. If you do not well, in other words, if you go negative volition to truth of the directive will of God, if you go the opposite direction, God tells you to do this, and you say, no, I'm going to do this. See, that's the point. This word in the Hebrew, yatab, means to do well by doing the revealed directive will of God. In other words, what did God tell you to do? Cain. He's got both boys standing there. Abel, what did I, what did I, what did I tell you in class? What to bring a blood offering? Did you bring it? Yes. Cain, what did I tell you in class that you had to bring for a sin offering? Blood. Well, why did you bring me a fruit salad? I, just, I don't know what he brought. He brought something from the ground. I just want you something I like. Since, it's, since it's, I can do that. I'm, right. So, why did you do that? Say, we're looking for motive. Why did you do that? And, he, and here's what he wants. He wants him to confess it. 
He wants him to confess his sin, and then he wants him to take a look at what his sin was doing to him. Look at, li listen, when you confess your sin, you should ask yourself in that confession is what this is about. What is that sin doing to me and my life? Well, it won't be good. The sin ain't, ain't going to make you look better. Then why do you keep doing it? If the sin doesn't do anything good for you, but does bad for you, why would you keep doing that? That's what he's after. He's after the motive behind it. See, you can confess your sin and maybe never deal with the source of it. That sin pattern that you have. Why do you get angry? It's never the same thing. It's certain buttons that are pushed that get you angry. And certain buttons that are pushed get you angry out of control. And you hate it when it's done and when it's over. You hate it. So why don't you address it? When you confess your sin, he wants you to see how that sin is disruptive, disruptive and destructive to your life. What should it be replaced with? With the word of God. Write these verses down. You need, you need these verses. If you want to get this corrected in your life, Write down Galatians 5, 16, 17. And Galatians 5, 22, 23. It says, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You see, Cain is into the desires of his flesh, but he don't have a Holy Spirit. He's an unbeliever. He's got to make the bold decision to believe that Jesus died for his sin, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. And so far, he's not been willing to buy into that because he brought a fruit offering, not a blood offering. Jesus Christ, the thing that makes Jesus Christ a savior is his shed blood, his burial and resurrection. That's what makes him who he is. Both Cain and Abel, this offering meant a sacrificial blood offering for Adam's original sin. Here is Hebrews 9.22. And according to the law, one all, may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And Cain understands this and is not willing to buy into it, not to believe it. Why did Cain get angry at God and why did he feel justified in his anger at God? Well, let's take a look at it. Cain is angry at God because he is operating from evil thinking. That we call it the old man cosmos diabolicus thinking in theology. He's going, listen, you're either in the world or in Christ. In Adam, you're in the world. In Christ, you're in the kingdom. The kingdom of the beloved son. You know, we read that in the first hour in Colossians 1.13. You should read that. You've been rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. Colossians 1.13. See, you should be operating out of the kingdom of God. And if you're not, then you're operating out of the other system. The cosmic system. Write this down. 1 John 5, 19. When you're in the domain of darkness or where you're in the cosmic system that fights against the word of God, that's the cosmic system. Worldly thinking. You're into evil. You're into evil. And who runs that system? Satan. That's, that's, that's 1 John 5, 19. The God of this world, Satan. And that's where Cain is. Listen, he's the same guy running the same system that got their, his Cain's mother and father. The devil got them. 
right? We're, we're just one generation down from that. My, my, my. Man, the devil running his old, his old, his old schemes. Cain was in opposition to the directive will of God regarding a sacrificial offering of blood atonement. For us, that is, listen, do you believe this is the gospel? The blood atonement business is the gospel. Do you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross? His blood is the blood atonement for sin. There is none other. Your good works, your joining churches, you, you saluting flags and all that kind of stuff, good stuff. I, I was in the military. I, I, I fought. I got a purple heart. I got this. I got that. It ain't going to get you to heaven. Those are all good things, but they won't get you to heaven. You got to believe that Jesus Christ came. It was, it was the righteous blood. He who knew no sin became sin for me. The righteous blood of Christ was given to me on my behalf for the unrighteousness of me. And when I accept it, then I'm made righteous in God, in Christ. My people, people need to know this stuff. You see, Cain made an issue out of a done issue. Do you see that? Cain made an issue out of a non issue for salvation. Well, why'd you do that? Is that not a fair question? Why would you do that? What other recourse do you think God was going to have, Cain, when you brought him that fruit salad and he's, he's asked for a blood offering from the Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world? What makes you think that God would accept anything like that? What made you think that? See, that's what God's after. Cain's opposition was believing that bringing his very best bloodless offering for Adam's sin was good enough for God to show him favor. Romans 3.20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Romans, the third chapter, verse 23-24, for all does it say some? It's on your paper. Does it say some? No. Nah, it says all. For all have sinned, you know why? In Adam, and fall short of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? Is Jesus Christ. He is the manifestation of the visibleness of God in the flesh. Being justified as a gift by his grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Here is Romans, the third chapter, verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified, see that's legal terms, is justified by faith apart from works of the law. There is no other way to be saved but through grace, by faith, in the work of Christ, the person and work of Jesus Christ. Point three, the devil ran a similar scheme against Adam and Eve. 2 Corinthians 2, 11 tells us not to be ignorant of his schemes. Let's show the devil's typical logic. How did, it, and here's how it runs. Let me just show you how this thing runs. We learned this when we were doing Job. We studied the book of Job. We learned this principle in the book. And here, here's how the devil plays this out in your life. He gets you to have a false assumption. It begins with a false assumption God says to Cain, I want, a, I want a blood offering. He makes a false assumption. Watch this. Here's his false assumption. My bloodless offering should be just as good as a blood offering for the atonement of sin. Right? Was it? He brought it for that reason. Agreed? Yeah. What was it? No, the directive will of God told you exactly what he wanted. He, he didn't, God didn't beat around the bush and say, well, let's see, I'll make up my mind when, when, when I see it. He didn't do that. He went, no, this is what it's got to be. A false assumption leads to a false interpretation. I'm, to, I'm showing you a system of how this stuff works so that you can unpack your baggage. 
a false interpretation. Here was Cain. My very best offering should be acceptable unto God. That's a false interpretation. My very best offering should be acceptable to God. But it contradicts the directive will of God. A false assumption leads to a false interpretation. It leads to a false expectation. My very best offering would be acceptable to gain the favor of God. That's a false expectation. Is it going to do that work? It did it work that way? No, it never does. It didn't work for him. It won't work for you. This won't work for you. But let me show you. What I'm showing you is how the system, how the devil's system works you. He gets you into a false assumption, a false interpretation, right? A false expectation, and then a false application. And when he gets to the false application, he's got you. He's got you in the mousetrap. Cain's bloodless sacrifice offering was rejected by God. Now what you going to do, see? I want you to know that when you confess your sin, what God is after is what, what's driving this? What thinking is going on in your mind? Because it's evil thinking operating in your life in some capacity that's shutting down the plan of God from working in your life. And here's how that system works. It works this way all the time. A false assumption, interpretation, expectation, and application, and then you're in the mousetrap. When Cain's offering was challenged once again by the directive will of God, he quizzed him. He asked him two questions. Cain was unwilling to repent. Metanoia changed his mind. He was unwilling to surrender his will to the will of God like Jesus had to to go to the cross in Matthew 26. And let me tell you, that's a no-win position. That's a no-win position. In conclusion, God issued a warning to Cain of the consequences of not repenting or changing his mind to do the directive will of God. God asked Cain two questions. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? In other words, we all can see when somebody gets really mad. We can see body language. When that body language gets, gets nutty, and gets out of control, you've got a bleed over, you've got a body, soul, and spirit out of whack. And the only person that can put them back together properly is God Almighty himself. And you've got to learn how to get rid of anger from your life. You've got to learn how to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Anger comes from the flesh. It doesn't come from the spirit. Write this down. It's important to you. That's why I tell you to write it down. You should write it down. You're not going to remember this. Don't be Cain. Please listen. Write this down. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And you should read that today. You should read that. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And you can drop down and look at 13. Everybody knows 13. They paid attention to none of the rest of it. God's answer to Cain, if you do well and if you don't do well. In other words, he gave a choice. I give you a choice today. You can do well or you can not do well. It depends on your attitude towards the will of God. What right, as a believer in Jesus Christ, do, what right do you have to get so mad that your body gets out of control? I mean, that's where road rage comes from and all of that stuff. 
you have no right to it. You have bought into a false assumption, interpretation, expectation, and application in your life. You have got to take care of the sin that's crouching at the door. And you've got to learn to master it. And you do it by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't master it in the flesh. You have to master it in the spirit. The Holy Spirit. Listen, write this down. 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in you, the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world, the devil. You've got to learn. You come here and stay a year with me. I'll teach you how to master this stuff. You can't come one time and get it. You come spend a year with me. You come spend a year with me. And you'll see changes in your life that are amazing. Let me conclude with Hebrews 11.4. This wonderful passage in, in Hebrews 11 on faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain through which he able obtained a testimony that was righteous. God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Isn't that something? Not Cain. Abel. Abel's testimony today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us, to open the Scriptures and have the Scripture open our lives to the truth. The devil is a liar. His nature is to lie and to deceive and to destroy. There's only two systems in this world that we live by. Either the cosmic system of evil thinking of the devil or the righteous system of God in Christ through the word of God. It's a magnificent book. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Bring us people who need to hear the truth of the word of God, Father. Let them become part of real dynamic change in their life where their body and their soul and their spirit are in union and in order of God, in the order of God. And other people will go like, what has happened to you? And the answer is transformation of Romans 12 to the transformation of Romans 12 to encourage our hearts, Father. Encourage our hearts. What made Abel any better than Cain? Nothing but faith. He operated his offering based on faith in the word of God. And God exercised the production of it. And we're so thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen.